Hello, I'm Rebecca Weber. You're watching Better for America, presented by AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens. Joining us today is Kaylee McGee White. Now, Kaylee McGee White is the Restoring America editor for the Washington Examiner, and she's focused as much on religion, politics, and culture. She is a visiting fellow at the Independent Women's Forum. She graduated from Hillsdale College with degrees in politics and journalism. Kaylee, welcome to Better for America. Good to have you here. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Kaylee, you've written extensively on universities and higher education, and it's no secret how left-leaning so many of these universities are today. In a recent article that you published, Can Higher Education Be Saved?, you wrote that more often than not, America's universities are focused on ideological goals that have nothing to do with academic inquiry and, in fact, regularly undermine it. Can you give us some examples how students themselves are plagued by leftist ideologues and the impact that this has on America's younger generation? Yeah, I think it's important to start by asking what is the purpose of higher education? Why do we send our kids to college in the first place? And really, there are two fundamental goals of a college education. The first is this idea that college is supposed to prepare students for the next phase of life, help them get better jobs, help them make more money in the future. The, the second purpose of higher education, which is the most important, is that higher education is supposed to help form the character of students. It's supposed to help them understand their, their own role in society, who they are as human beings, and what they have to give to society and, and what their place is in it. Unfortunately, both of those goals have been completely distorted by the vast majority of college campuses today. There's a reason why in a recent poll, more than 56% of Americans said they have very little confidence in America's colleges to be able to prepare students for better jobs. There's a reason why co colleges are saddling students with tens of thousands of student loan debt that students are struggling to repay because they're not getting those good paying jobs that they thought that they were going to get. And the second point, to your point about how left-leaning college campuses have become, colleges have stopped trying to teach students a variety of perspectives meant to help them figure out their own opinions and their own beliefs, and have instead started indoctrinating them and telling them what they should believe and how they should act and what they should say. One example of this and what we is what we call service learning, which is sort of a newer phenomenon on the higher education campus. And service learning, are it's made up of courses taught by college administrators rather than professors. And service learning it, it consists of basically courses that encourage students to participate in civic activity within their community. That could be volunteering at local organizations or it could be taking part in a protest, volunteering at the local Planned Parenthood. And students are getting actual college credit for taking part in these activities. Now, of course, the goal of these things is to encourage students to participate in left-wing civic activities. Hardly ever will you see professors or administrators encourage students to partake in a conservative rally or host a conservative speaker. So there is a specific ideological bent that students are being pushed toward. Very interesting and such a good point. Uh, and this is perhaps one way that we could win back our universities and, and restore them. But uh, how exactly do you think we can do that? In addition to some of these great ideas, like, you know, really getting into the universities and saying, hey, let's level the playing field and give choice and and let's not indoctrinate and uh, try to raise, you know, these these young students to uh, and tell them what to think, but rather teach them how to think. Uh, how do we restore these universities to their original purpose? Yeah, it, that's a good question. I, I think there are many ways that we could do that. Many of them are actively being debated right now among lawmakers, among policy experts. Um, but the first and most important thing to remember about universities, especially public universities, public colleges, is that they are ultimately institutions at the behold, at the behest of the state. They receive state funds. They receive taxpayer dollars to do what they are supposed to do. Now, that gives state officials enormous power to actually dictate 
the ideological bent of these universities. Few state officials want to use that authority because they don't want to appear to interfere with education as a whole. But the fact is that that authority is there for them to use. And we need to remember that if public, publicly funded universities are not only not upholding their mission, but actively betraying it to the detriment of society at large, we also have a responsibility to hold them accountable and to use whatever power that we have to turn the tide and to force them to start upholding that mission once again. Mm. And so many are not shy about opposing school choice, even freedom of speech on campuses, and in fact do promote transgenderism and, and of course, critical race theory in its curriculum. Uh, during your time in school, you're, you're a young woman. Did you see any of this occurring? Do you think this is relatively new? Oh, it's very, it's very relatively new. Um, I went to Hillsdale College, which is um, a, a great school, highly recommend. So I was luckily spared from any of the leftist insanity that you see on a lot of college campuses. But I did go to a public school all throughout middle and high school. And even then, I did not experience the sort of uh, madness that many students are being exposed to in those younger grades, specifically when we're talking about critical race theory or gender ideology or some of these more left-wing concepts that have now become commonplace in most K-12 through classrooms, I did not experience any of that. And it is a very relatively recent phenomenon that has captured America's education system really over the past six or seven years is when it has started to accelerate. Mm. Now, in your article, A Better Kind of College Blacklist, you argue here that the college students who endorse or engage in radical and morally rep reprehensible actions are a product of the institutional environment, and you suggest that employers should consider blacklisting entire schools. Can you share with us how this aligns with sort of your vision for addressing the moral and ideological changes in academia, and what impact do you see uh, on these institutions if this were to, were to occur? Yeah, so this article is specifically addressing the rise in radicalism that we've seen on display over the past week after Hamas's attack on Israel, where you see a number of students openly endorsing a terrorist organization and the attacks on Jewish Israelis. And my argument is that this is not an isolated radicalism. This is not a limited radicalism. This is actually very in line with other behavior that we've seen displayed over the past several years, like shouting down conservative speakers on campus or chasing people down out of campus if they express views that they disagree with. So one of the polls that I cite in my article is one that found that more than a quarter of students support using violence to shut down speech with which they disagree. And we've seen students actually act on this belief on campuses over the past couple of years. For example, former NCAA swimmer Riley Gaines was physically attacked at San Francisco State University when she tried to give a lecture there. Judge Kyle Duncan, who was appointed by former President Donald Trump, was told by one student that they hoped that his daughters were raped because of his judicial opinions on abortion and transgenderism. These are radical beliefs that are unfortunately commonplace among a large number of college students. So my point is that we shouldn't be surprised by what we're seeing now with the open support of Hamas. Um, it's very in line with what these college students have said for years that they, that they believe. And so my argument here is that um, you know, a number of employers have come out over the past week and said, we're very concerned about these students who are at these protests, who are wearing the paragliders that Hamas terrorists use, who are endorsing the genocide of Jewish people. And they want those students blacklisted from future careers because obviously you are not capable of participating in a society that is grounded on basic ethical norms if you're endorsing the actions of a terrorist organization. But again, my point is that it's not limited to just these individual students. This is a culture of radicalism that has been encouraged and fostered by the universities themselves. And that's what that poll proves. That's what the actions of students over the past several years prove. So employers are better off 
looking at these schools that have refused to condemn the toxic behavior of their students and saying, you know what? These schools are not going to be producing good ethical employees and we should not hire from them. Now, of course, are there going to be some good apples within the bad universities? Yes. Might some of them end up getting inadvertently punished as a result of entire college blacklists? Yes, that's the unfortunate case. But what entire college blacklists also help do is they incentivize students who actually care about education, who actually care about being productive citizens. It discourages those students from seeking to affiliate with schools like Harvard, like Stanford, like Yale, that have proven themselves to be morally bankrupt. Mm. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Very interesting. And, uh, you know, you're right about societal changes over the last handful of years. We've seen so much change. For example, students of Clemson University marched on camps, uh, campus to demand the return of menstrual products, including tampons, in the men's bathroom. I mean, who would have thought, right? Just 10 years ago, you couldn't imagine this. Last year, a Planned Parenthood doctor testified at a House hearing and said that men can get pregnant. And when our own Supreme Court justice can't define a woman, what does that tell you about American culture and how concerned should we be? You know, how do we bring back common sense and objective truth? Yeah, and that you just hit the nail on the head, because what we're experiencing with this rise of gender ideology is a rejection of, of, of objective truth itself. So this idea that there aren't two sexes, that you can choose whatever you want to be, that you can change who you are without any consequences, that's asinine. It's not true. And yet we're being told and we are teaching millions of young children that they can reject objective truth about who they are and about how they fit into this world. Objective truth about basic biological realities with zero consequence. And there have already been serious consequences from that ideological indoctrination. The rise in detransitioners who have horrible stories of the consequences that they're dealing with, both physically and emotionally, from being captured by this ideology, by trying to destroy who they were and change who they were because they believed that they could, these stories are harrowing and should really give us pause to consider what we're doing to the next generation. But you're right, some of the examples that you listed, the ideological rot runs deep and it is thorough. It has captured almost every single American institution from the Supreme Court, at least with one justice, to the K through 12 public education system, to healthcare, to the entire scientific research community. It is deep, it is rotten, and it has to be rooted out. Yeah, and speaking of truth, many people are tuned out because they simply don't know what to believe. Now, as someone in the industry, why do you think that a growing number of Americans have lost faith in trusting the news that they read? And how do we restore ethics in journalism? Well, the media is solely to blame for the loss in public trust. Um, you know, when you have major institutions that have been respected for years as sort of the, the key publications to turn to, like the Washington Post or the New York Times, both of which unapologetically teach gender ideology as fact by using preferred pronouns, by unironically referring to biological men as women, if that's what they want to be referred to as. I mean, these are you, you've given up any credibility that you once had if you endorse those concepts. And not only that, but you have this basic blatant open acceptance of one specific agenda, which is the left-wing agenda by publications, again, like the Washington Post and New York Times, where, again, they are unapologetically running cover for one side of the political spectrum, and they're clearly trying to push that agenda onto the public. And the American public has woken up to this fact over the past four years. Now, I don't think that it's necessarily a new concept or even a bad concept to have a biased media. If you go back to really even the founding era when journalism was just getting started in the American public, journalism was always considered to be a biased thing. You had specific papers that were associated with the Federalists, and then you had specific publications that were associated with the Anti-Federalists, and everyone knew where those publications stood. 
The problem is that for the past several decades, we've been operating under the assumption that all of our news outlets were supposed to be neutral, or at least moderate, and that they weren't supposed to be pushing their own agenda onto their readers. Well, we're clearly not at that point anymore. We do have very biased publications. The Washington Post is very biased towards Democrats. The Daily Caller is very biased towards Republicans. That's okay, and that's fine, but we have to get out from under this idea that news publications are neutral. And that's the problem here, is that we're operating under a tension where publications are pursuing their own agendas while trying to remain neutral, or in this, or in some cases, uh, you know, you think about PBS, NPR, actually receiving state funds because they're supposedly neutral. That's a big problem, and that's what needs to change. Interesting. And we see how the media landscape has changed and evolved so much just in the last few years due to advances in technology. Uh, what do you see as the future of journalism, especially in light of alternative and social media's influence on news dissemination? Yeah, well, I, I think it's a evolving industry. It's a constantly growing industry. Social media has changed the game for journalism a lot, um, even over the past couple of years since Elon Musk purchased Twitter, which is now known as X. That has massively changed the game for conservative journalists, especially who were being restricted on the platform from, from speaking their minds. Um, Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter and his attempt to sort of make it its own news conglomerate site where Journalists are encouraged to post their articles in full form just on X rather than sharing links to their articles published on a different website. He's trying to sort of change the game here, and we'll see what ends up happening with it. It's interesting. I think it's hard to say or hard to predict how well it's end up it's going to go or whether it will change things in the long run. But there's certainly a potential for it, too. Um, you see major publications, again, like the Washington Post, hemorrhaging subscribers currently to the point where the Washington Post had to lay off hundreds of employees this past month. There is a decreasing appetite among the public for traditional forms of media like newspapers, um, even like cable TV. The, the, the viewership has dropped dramatically over the past couple of years versus what it had been. So there is absolutely opportunities for alternative media. There's absolutely an, uh, an opportunity for social media websites to sort of take up and pioneer what the next media landscape is going to look like. And I think that Elon Musk is going to be one of those pioneers. I think that um, Substack and a lot of these other independent websites that have come up over the past few years, they're also going to play a major role in the days ahead. Yeah, what Elon Musk did uh, with those files that he released really, I think, uh, cracked the, uh, you, you know, opened up people's eyes and really put a, put a dent in uh, the truth that, you know, misinformation is out there. You can't believe everything that you, that you read and hear. You've got to do your research. You've got to know that you're listening to organizations or groups that uh, are going to have a slant or a bias. And uh, so long as you understand that, I think it's better than to get to the truth. Kaylee, before we let you run, for any young aspiring journalist who's listening, um, what advice might you give them? I think my advice is to stay humble, recognize that when you're getting into this industry, you don't know everything and that you're going to learn a lot and you're going to have opinions that someday you're probably going to regret and that you're going to change. And that's just a part of the process. That's part of maturation. It's part of growing up. Um, but I, I think that people who kind of get ahead of their skis and expect everything to be handed to them just because they write a couple of articles, that's the wrong perspective to have. Stay humble, always ask for help, and always be eager to learn, especially from people who have been doing it a lot longer than you. Kaylee, thank you so much. Kaylee McGee-White, you're, you're a gem. Thank you for all the great work you do, and God bless you. Thank you. The Association of Mature American Citizens is the conservative voice for Americans 50 and older. AMAC is fighting for the values that you hold dear. Join today. Together, we can right the course of America.